in our day, we have, uh, we find ourselves at the end of a, a long series of trends and fads and movements that have affected the church for quite some time. Today, you would notice that books on the subject of sanctification abound. Christians are increasingly curious how to change themselves, or Christians are convinced that the Christian life is not so much about changing at all. It's not so much about increasing in practical righteousness, but something else altogether. In our day, there's been a recovery of the gospel truths and the doctrines of the Reformation, the doctrines of grace, as we call them, or the, also the five solas, sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christus, sola, soli deo gloria, that salvation is according to scripture alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. We rejoice in that recovery, certainly. Preachers and churchmen have taken up fresh arms against legalism. That is also a good thing, which is the belief that our own good works are what make us, us right with God. That is good, even though with that has come a broadening of that definition. And so the idea of legalism in our day has come to also include a discouragement against performing any good works that actually do please God in a real practical sense. Legalism has become the only error that it seems some find worth guarding the church against. Whereas the opposite error of antinomianism, lawlessness, uh, taking God's grace as a license to sin, is hardly seen as any threat to Christians at all nowadays by some. There's been an increasing focus in our day on the emotional aspect of the Christian life, an emphasis on joy, so-called, uh, a delighting in God, seeing God's beauty and loving him in return in an emotional sense, that is, has increased in our day. Have you noticed that there are more books being written by living authors about what Christians should do with their emotions. Maybe you have some of those books on your shelves. Maybe you're reading or have read some of those books. Maybe you've been tremendously helped by some of those books. But just by the sheer number of books increase in literature, podcasts, episodes, blog posts being written, articles being published. It's, it's undeniable that there is an increasing focus on the emotional aspect of the Christian life and what we should do or feel, rather, with our emotions. In our day, corporate Sunday gatherings are viewed as a spectator sport, a good but not necessarily essential event to be experienced rather than a necessary grace in which we are responsible to participate. Sermons are motivational speeches, songs are emotional stimulants, and serving in some churches is about selling the product so that the church-going consumers are satisfied. This is what many church services have become. And it is increasingly popular to broaden or remove doctrinal distinctives, things that protect or 
make Christianity, genuine biblical Christianity, distinct from other belief systems. Uh, This is done so that what unifies us ends up being the lowest common denominator, doctrinally speaking. That is seen as noble, which is why so many Protestants in our day are able to align themselves with Catholics and wildly charismatic movements, unqualified and or disqualified teachers. This is just for a variety of reasons where we find ourselves in our day. And alongside these trends in the broader context of the American church has come immense confusion about the doctrine of sanctification, growth in Christ likeness. We have misdescribed and misdefined what it means to be like Jesus. This will come as no surprise to you. These errors are ubiquitous and inescapable because they come at us from so many different angles, from so many different sources. Many think about sanctification in psychological terms, like needing to heal or become healthy. Godliness has become equated with maintaining solidarity with self-proclaimed victims of injustice, support of and charity toward marginalized people groups uh, who are also often known as the least of these from a poor interpretation of Matthew 25. Groups like immigrants, minorities, the homeless population, those who might be underemployed, single parents, these get treated as if that is the essence of of godliness, supporting those groups, showing charity towards those groups. Those have been equated with Christ-likeness in our day. We've uh, especially seen godliness misdefined as it gets equated with personal preferences, uh, which are oftentimes some niche cultural cause. Things like homeschooling or mask wearing or getting a vaccine or opposing tyrannical government mandates and the politicians who impose them. These things have become equated with godliness in our day. Some have even come to believe that God's grace in the gospel removes any obligation from the Christian at all to obey God that now since we have been set free from God's grace, so it said, we don't obey out of any sense of duty or obligation on our part. Grace has liberated us from those things. So now instead of obeying out of duty or obligation, we obey God merely because we want to or we feel like it because we simply delight in doing so. There's been a shift in the weight of of those claims. And some have even taken what have always become simple matters of obedience for really all of church history. They've taken those issues out of the category of obedience altogether and have made clear sins like anxiety into things that are morally neutral. Specifically, this has been the claim of some entire biblical counseling organizations that anxiety is no longer sinful because even though God says in the Old Testament, do not fear, and even though Jesus says in the gospel, the gospels, uh, be anxious for nothing, do not be anxious, and even though his apostles teach, be anxious for nothing, cast your anxieties on the Lord, these are not really commands that can be disobeyed. They're really kind encouragements from God intended to comfort his people. So the saying goes. And still others are convinced that 
ridding our lives of unacceptable behaviors, harmful thought patterns, unpleasant emotions. This is the business of the professional, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, that these problems can be medicated away. These are matters that don't find their origin in the sinful human heart. Therefore, they cannot be changed by submission to God in faith and obedience is the belief of some. And finally, Christians have embraced the lie that true, thorough change isn't even possible. Some would say that we're all just broken people who perpetually fail in our walk with God. And even though you may not see real lasting change in your life, that is just the norm of the Christian walk. Welcome to the Christian life. Entire series of books have been written to that group of believers, people who do not find progress in their sanctification because that's just the way it goes. Because the Christian life is messy, God accepts us the way we are, of course, and he understands our messiness. And so real change shouldn't be expected. The sins that you do struggle with or have always struggled with are just par for the course. We'll always struggle forever to the same degree with the same sins is the belief of some. And these are just commonplace, unfortunately, in the church. These half-truths, these falsehoods, All of these and many other subtle errors have confused this very doctrine that we are discussing today, the doctrine of sanctification. In my own experience, we as believers know that we should change. That's fairly common, easy to understand by Christians that we must change. We are, when we, the moment we accept the gospel, embracing the notion that we are corrupt, sinful, all is not right with us. We need a savior. We need to change. We need to be changed. And we're incapable of producing the much needed change in our own souls. And so we know that we must change. We accept that we are sinful. We embrace the gospel that it is our only hope for a right standing before God. And so we know that we have remaining indwelling sin as believers. That's not a surprise to those of us who believe a biblical gospel. And so if you ask the Christian how he intends the, to change into Christ's likeness, Usually, a Christian who is not devoid of all biblical truth will say something about the Word of God in prayer. They know, well, my changing will require me to read the Bible, to lay hold of some biblical truth in some way. That's pretty common knowledge. They know, well, I need to ask for God's help in changing. But often, in my own experience, that's about as far as the knowledge of many Christians goes. I know I need to change. I know the Bible's important. I'm going to ask God and hope for the best. Oftentimes, we can lack the clarity necessary to embark on an intentional, uh, diligent pursuit of the holiness that God gives. You go to small group, we confess sin to each other, humbly so, and you ask the person who's confessing the sin, who, who has perhaps confessed the same sin, week after week, 
tell me what you, what's your plan for, for changing for real at the heart level for becoming a different person. So next month, there's a different report. There's some semblance of change. You, you can recognize tangible progress in this area of your life. What's, what's your plan? Just practically lay it out for us. Oftentimes, many will not know. Well, I'm praying. I'm asking God to change me. I'm still reading my Bible on a Bible reading plan. I think I'm doing the right things. We need greater clarity than that to use God's means to change intentionally. And so these, uh, these are right impulses for the Christian, but we need a greater specificity to how to use God's means to work alongside God in our own lives so that we look more like the Savior whom we love. Open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. How important is it for us to have clarity in this area of our Christian lives? How important, how essential is it for us to know not just theoretically, certainly, at the level of Bible knowledge, but by experience to know the doctrine of sanctification. The writer of Hebrews tells us in verse 14 how important this is. Hebrews 12, 14. He says to his audience, pursue peace with all men and pursue the sanctification, the holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. This is not a positional or imputed holiness. This is a practical righteousness that he has in view. How do we know that? Because it's commanded. He's telling them to pursue this. Just like the peace with all men is to be continually pursued day after day in an ongoing way, so also is sanctification to be daily pursued by God's people. You do not daily have to pursue positional righteousness before God. You have, if you're a believer, been made once for all time righteous before God. God has imputed, charged to your account, Christ's own spotless righteousness so that before God you possess the very righteous character of the son of God himself. So God can declare you who have faith righteous. That is what justification is. That is what imputation is to be justified or declared righteous before God, having the righteousness of Christ charged or imputed to your account. You do not have to daily wake up wondering whether God declares you righteous if you believe him. You don't have to strive for your justification. What you do have to pursue, though, is sanctification. The author says, without this, No one will see the Lord. How can he say such things that without holiness of life, no one will see the Lord? The reason the author can lay claim to that 
is because everyone who is justified by God is also sanctified by God. And so this really, this command, submission to this command, becomes a tremendous encouragement for the believer. Do you see this happening in your life? Are you pursuing the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord? Are you laying hold of true holiness? Then you can take great comfort that God has saved you. The only people who are sanctified are the ones who have been justified by God. And so as you behold growth to any degree of Christ-likeness in your life, then that becomes a tremendous occasion for joy and encouragement and comfort from God. But this verse demonstrates how important it is for us to have clarity on this doctrine so that we can make progress in this area. So with this equipping our series, let me just tell you briefly where we're, where we're going. What I didn't want to do in trying to cover the doctrine of sanctification is to take six weeks, cram as much as possible into that six weeks, uh, and give you whatever clarity could come from a six-week deep dive into sanctification. And so instead of that, this is the first of several uh, mini-series in Equipping Hour that will just take the, the needed time to, to cover sanctification, the various facets of sanctification. This uh, first mini-series will be an introduction. Today we're talking about what is sanctification. We'll also look at the priority of holiness, that holiness is the priority of the Christian life. We'll look at what is the foundation of sanctification, its connection to salvation. We'll talk about God's role in our sanctification as well as our role in sanctification. And we'll talk about purity of heart. Is purity of heart even possible? And since it is possible, how do we obtain purity of heart? We'll come back and talk about sanctification in sin, the doctrine of homartiology, uh, the doctrine of sin. What is sin? Why is sin sinful? What are the benefits and blessings of studying homartiology? You will be tremendously encouraged, I'm sure, to learn more about your own sin. God intends our encouragement in a study like that. We'll talk about what is repentance and how do we repent well? How do we repent biblically? And we'll talk about what are the, as John Newton called it, advantages of remaining sin. Are there advantages to God permitting indwelling sin in the believer and not sanctifying us in an instant? There are. We'll talk about what those advantages are. And we'll study hypocrisy so that we can be further guarded against insincerity in our walks. We'll talk about the role of faith in sanctification in a separate study. What is biblical faith and why does sanctification only occur by faith in the Christian? We'll talk about what are the enemies or impediments to biblical faith, things like doubt, unteachableness, disobedience, idolatry of emotions and feelings. And in that series, I, I want to get a better grasp of biblical habits and help us come to a better understanding of thinking biblically about habits. 
We'll talk about errors in sanctification, old and older ones. There are no really new ones. So we'll talk about old and older errors in sanctification. Things like perfectionism, pietism, passivism, and passionism. Seeking to be sanctified by the emotions. And then we'll divide up uh, a couple series on particularly talking about the means of grace. God certainly has ordained that we change. He's the architect of our sanctification, both the author and finisher of our faith. But he gives means by which that is accomplished. And so we'll talk about the role of God's word in sanctification, why the word sanctifies, how to read our Bibles for the purpose of sanctification. What do you do in your quiet time? If you're a young mom with little children, how should you think about quiet time? We'll talk about hearing the word for the purpose of sanctification. We'll talk about counseling, teaching the word for the purpose of sanctification how to increase in effectiveness. We'll talk about prayer and fellowship in a separate series. Uh, What are characteristics of sanctified or sanctifying prayers? How can you pray the word in such a way that pleases God and that God intends to use in your own life to help you increase in godliness? Prayer is intended to help us increase in godliness. We'll talk about our responsibility to one another, our responsibility for one another's holiness, and what are elements of sanctifying fellowship. It requires more than just being in the company of Christians. And so we'll discuss what are those elements of fellowship that actually help us increase in godliness. And then we'll talk about Finally, sanctification and eschatology. Sanctification and eschatology, the future. Uh, God intends that area of doctrine that can be oftentimes so clouded in mystery and confusion. God intends us to be sanctified by what he says about the future. And so we'll talk about a number of future realities, events like the day of the Lord, the coming kingdom, Uh, meditating on both heaven and hell and hoping in our forthcoming glorification. All of those things, all of those events are intended to sanctify us in the here and now. And so the better equipped we are to think about those realities, the more holy we will be. So that's a lot of ground to cover. Stick around. Uh, We'll we'll have upwards of of 30 messages to cover all of those things. And really, it's my hope that this would become a a useful resource for our our church for the future, uh, that it would be lessons, uh, sermons that we come back to time and again, uh, that you'll be able to share with people who are newer to our church uh, later down the road to help incoming members and uh, those who have been members for a long time to have a greater understanding of this doctrine. But today where we're beginning is just answering the question, what is sanctification? What is sanctification? I've already described it in short, it's conformity to Christ likeness. But just uh, as as an aside, what sanctification cannot be, before we give a, a definition of sanctification, what sanctification cannot be is something that the world understands. It can't be something that the world gets. Whatever your definition, however you think about and describe sanctification, to the unbeliever, it can't compute. It can't make sense whether an unbeliever hears 
your description of sanctification, and they go, oh, yeah, I know about that. That makes total sense. Why you would try and change like that, why you would think of change like that. If it makes sense to the unbeliever, then it is not the things of God, because the natural man cannot understand the things of God. He's unable to understand the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says. And so it can't be understood by the world. Sanctification also cannot be something that the world desires. It can't be something that the world wants so that our definition of sanctification, the world finds appealing. The world is repulsed by God's plan for change. Before you were a believer and had been saved by God, you wanted no part of God's brand of change. You didn't want to change on his terms. None of us did. That is why we resisted believing him. And so it can't be something that the world understands. It can't be something the world desires. Sanctification also cannot be something that the world can accomplish. It can't be something that the world can accomplish. If, if an unbeliever wanted to know from you, how can I fix this ruined area of my life? If you gave them a plan for change, for sanctification, and they could accomplish it in their own strength before they believe the gospel and without the word of God, then whatever you told them was not sanctification. You can't counsel the unbeliever on God's terms and them actually do it still as an unbeliever, them obey as an unbeliever. And so this cannot be something accomplished by the unbeliever. If the unbeliever could accomplish God's brand of change, then God would not receive all the glory from their change. And so it would contradict the very reason that sanctification exists, which is for the glory of God. So it cannot be something that can be accomplished by the unbeliever. And lastly, it can't be something that the world actually pursues. If the world pursues it, if the world is going after it, that kind of change, then you can just mark it off. That must not be God's version of sanctification. Changing society, improving people's self-esteem, bringing some practical type of life change, uh, convincing people that they don't have to be alcoholics by a God of their own making. I mean, that is happening in the world. People are being helped to not be alcoholics anymore. Uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, those programs, they actually in some cases, are effective for what they're intending, but never for what God is intending, because that is not sanctification. And so since sanctification cannot be something that the world understands, desires, can accomplish, or pursues, then what in the world is sanctification? Lots of helpful ways to define this, Here's my attempt at a working definition, and this is the only slide that you'll have. Sanctification is that God wrought comprehensive but gradual conformity to Christ's likeness, which follows conversion and originates in the heart as the child of God actively submits his will to God by faith for the glory of God. That is one way to describe, to define sanctification. Sanctification, one more time, is that God wrought comprehensive but gradual conformity to Christ's likeness, which follows conversion and originates in the heart 
as the child of God actively submits his will to God by faith for the glory of God. Much more could be added to that definition to fill it out. But this definition includes 10 different elements essential to the way that we must think about sanctification. Uh, Any loss of these 10 elements in our thinking uh, would produce an understanding of sanctification that is lacking in some respect. And so for the remainder of our time, we'll just quickly work through these 10 characteristics of biblical sanctification. And all of these, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. As time permits, I'll flip around as much as I can. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and the surrounding context, you can see all or almost all of these elements present. Paul, when he describes sanctification in this portion of your Bible, has all of these things in mind, which is evident from a careful reading of the context. And just to to start, sanctification is God wrought or produced by God. This is ultimately due to God's working in an individual. God is the one who ultimately brings this about. I like Mike Riccardi's uh, subtitle to his book, Sanctification. The title of that book is Sanctification, the Christian's Pursuit of God-Given Holiness. The Christian's Pursuit of God-Given Holiness. The believer is pursuing something that is given to him by God. That's right. That's the right way to think about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, indicates this. But we all, Paul says, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And just, we could save ourselves some time here if we just read, uh, just back up to verse 12, because so much of these distinctives will come from this context. Paul tells the Corinthians, therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech and are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what, of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the image of, into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit. This first element of biblical sanctification, that it is God wrought, it is produced by God, you see in that phrase, are being transformed. We, dot, 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 are being transformed. That is what is called a divine passive, are being transformed. It doesn't say that we are transforming ourselves It says we are being transformed. It's passive. We, in one sense, are passive in this pursuit of sanctification. The transformation 
into Christ likeness, the image of Christ, who is the image of the glory of God. This is something that is happening to us. And God is obviously the one doing this in the background. He is the one producing the transformation of life in us. This is why when you see yourself transformed, you know God is at work and you can freely praise him for the work that he's doing in your life. What do you say to each other? I see God's grace in, in your life. I see God's grace at work in you. What do we mean by that? Hopefully we, what we mean is God is in his undeserved kindness toward you, changing you. He's producing godliness in you. All of the ways you're going about pleasing him, that's due to him. All glory be to him for the change that I see in you. That is what it means for God's grace to be at work in us. So sanctification first is God wrought. Ephesians 4 even says, from him, from whom, that is Christ, who is the head, come the maturity uh, and conformity into his likeness. This is all from him. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 is a popular passage as well. It is you who are to obey, Paul tells the Philippians, not only as when he was present, but also in his absence, uh, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You work because God's at work in you. Sanctification is God wrought. Secondly, sanctification is comprehensive. Sanctification is comprehensive. This means that sanctification is not just a change of thoughts. It's not just a change of emotions. It's not just a change of actions. It's comprehensive. It's a change of all of those things. All of those various faculties of man are in mind. They are what God has in view when he undertakes to change an individual. When we are being sanctified, it is at the inside, the, the level of the inner life, as well as externally. The heart is changed. The mind is changed. The will is altered. The motives are changed. The desires change. Your attitude, your speech, what you do with your bodily members, the places you go, all of that is what is aimed at in sanctification. This is why so much of what's being written today um, in the, the gospel-centered movement lacks a biblical view of sanctification. All it targets is the emotions, or all it targets is the emotions and uh, your remembering your mind and remembering the gospel, and that's treated as sufficient. That's not sufficient. It's comprehensive. Uh, again, in 2 Corinthians 3, we are being transformed. It's the whole man that is in view. Uh, even what Paul, some of the things that he mentions that he did as he demonstrated genuine godliness to the Corinthians, if we were to read all of chapter 3, we would see he cared about the Corinthians uh, in the way he cared for them, the confidence that he had, the way he thought about himself as a servant, his convictions were godly. And then what he did as a minister and practicing sincerity and godliness, he mentions all of those things in chapter three. And so what you have in view, even from Paul, is Paul's own heart motives, Paul's attitude, Paul's thinking, and Paul's actions, things that he's doing. Uh, as Paul was conformed to Christ's likeness, all of those areas of Paul's life were impacted for increasing holiness. So sanctification is God wrought, it is comprehensive, and it is gradual. It does not happen in... Uh, 
in one event to the next event. You don't have to wait till Sunday, Sunday after Sunday. I'm making huge leaps in my sanctification. That's not how God intends uh, sanctification to happen typically. Um, one significant life-altering moment at a time, but it's gradual. Again, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being transformed, uh, Paul says, into the same image from glory to glory, from glory to glory. That's uh, from one degree of glory to the next, able to increase in our ability to reflect the glory of God. And you do that as you increase in holiness. So this is gradual or incremental change. Second Peter chapter one, you can write down verses five to eight and second Peter one. If you're taking notes, Peter talks about adding to adding to your knowledge, adding to your faith. And then he lists various godly characteristics that implies that sanctification is, in fact, gradual, something that can be added to day by day. Sanctification is that God-wrought, comprehensive, but gradual, number four, conformity to Christ-likeness. Conformity to Christ-likeness. Not even, again, leaving our passage, 2 Corinthians three seventeen. Now the Lord is the Spirit... That is true. The Lord is the spirit. And it's also true that he is the Lord or the spirit of the Lord. The spirit is the Lord. And the Lord has a spirit, you could say. Both these things are true. The Lord is the spirit. The spirit, the Holy Spirit is God. And Paul says in verse 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This is the spirit who is uh, belonging to the Lord. That is the Lord Jesus. Verse 18 goes on, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That there seeming to be Jesus himself are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And there you have, again, a statement of the Spirit's own deity. As we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image. That is the image of Christ, the image of Jesus, the Lord, the Lord Jesus. He mentions this, uh, this same, that Christ is the image of God. There's another reference to the image just a few verses later in chapter 4, starting at verse 3, where Paul says, and even if our gospel is veiled, because it is veiled, but it's only veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is, Christ is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. So this image of God, Christ, is it. And we, in sanctification, are being conformed to the one who is the image of God, Jesus himself. We are being made in all of our various faculties. Again, it's comprehensive. We are being conformed to Christ so that our will becomes more like Jesus' will, so that our desires become more like Jesus' desires, so that our emotions become more like Christ's emotions. We learn to hate what he hates, love what he loves so that our deeds become more like the very deeds that Jesus did and would practice. This is comprehensive, gradual conformity to Christ-likeness. 
Fifthly, this always follows conversion and only follows conversion. Never before, only after. This is the God-wrought, comprehensive, gradual conformity to Christ-likeness, which follows conversion. The phrase in 2 Corinthians 3.18, unveiled face, it is we all with unveiled face, having the face unveiled to adopt his, his wording, the face must have the veil removed from it. And here he is talking about, uh, he's using an, an analogy. What happened with Moses, a veil prevented Israel from seeing the glory of God in Moses as, as his face shone when he came off of Mount Sinai? Well, similarly, something's happening with unbelievers, he says, in verse 14 of chapter 3 in 2 Corinthians. Their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, still, when Moses is read, they still don't see the glory of God coming from Moses, from his words. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed only in Christ. A veil, verse 15, lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When the veil is taken away is when the person turns to the Lord. When the person turns to the Lord is when the veil is taken away. And so in verse 18, for us to behold the glory of the Lord, that only ever happens with unveiled face. You have to have a heart that is no longer hardened, eyes that are no longer blind, that are able to see the glory of God in Christ, in the gospel in God's word. It is God wrought comprehensive, gradual conformity to Christ likeness. It follows conversion and it originates in the heart. It originates in the heart. The change that God is after is not behavior modification. And this has always been the case. Proverbs 423 with all vigilance, guard your heart. For from it flow the springs of life. The heart is what is in view primarily. New Testament, guard your own life and doctrine. Paul told Timothy, it is the inner life that is in view. You can write down Romans 6, 17. Paul says, but you became obedient from the heart. Any change that happens externally devoid of the heart is not biblical change. The heart is the origination, the source of all true sanctification. And so the heart must be altered in such a way that what flows from the heart, which is everything, is also changed. It originates in the heart. This belongs to every child of God, Romans 8, 18 through 17 say, Obviously, this is the case if it follows conversion. Uh, sanctification is the right, the privilege of every child of God. Once you've been adopted through faith by God, then sanctification begins. Praise God. Hebrews 12, 7 through 10 emphasize the same things. God disciplines us so that we might share in his holiness. Anyone left without discipline he says, is an illegitimate son. You're not an actual child then, if God doesn't discipline you for the sake of sharing in his holiness. So sanctification is the privilege and right of every child of God. It requires the active submission of the will to God. Notice, again, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being transformed into the image of God. That's the passive portion, what God is doing. But what are we doing? Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. It is us 
seeking actively, participating actively to behold the glory of God, to have an increasing view of God's greatness so that we are motivated, compelled to change because we know better the God who is producing that change in us. That's our part. That's our duty. And obviously, every command in the New Testament would fit into this category. We actively have to obey. God's not obeying for you. God does not mortify sin for you. You're told to mortify sin. We are active in submitting our will to God. By faith, Romans 1.17 describes the, the summation of the Christian life. The righteous live by faith. Faith is the means by which we change. Hebrews 11, some 19 times as it describes the hall of faith, says by faith they did this, by faith they did this, by faith they did this. They obeyed God because they believed God. And then finally, sanctification is for the glory of God. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and not glorify you. They may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. The ultimate goal and our motivation for living lives that please God practically righteous lives is so that God would be glorified in us. And the better understanding we have of these things, the better we will be able to go after change so that it glorifies God. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these comforting words to us that we can actually change. Imagine that before we had no desire to change and we couldn't because we didn't want to, and yet you have given us new natures that love to bring you glory, love to be conformed to Christ's likeness, not for our own good merely, but for your glory ultimately. And I pray you would give us a better view of these things so that we would pursue your God-given holiness more effectively in our own lives. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.